will the wicked prosper? How long will our suffering last? How long before you make everything right? We pray to you, then sit in silence, waiting for a response. Minutes pass into days, months turn into years. How long, O oh Lord? It's said that you're not slow to act, but patient, waiting for our hearts to turn back to you. In the meantime, we are here, watching, waiting for you. Good morning, Lomax family. Today is Sunday, July the 26th, 2020, and we once again welcome you to our worship experience. If you would turn with me to our scripture text for today, which can be found in 1 Kings, the third chapter, beginning at the third verse, and we will read through verse number 14. 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, reading through verse 14. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in his statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this day that you've blessed us with, this Lord's Day. God, we don't take it for granted this opportunity to once again assemble virtually to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, God, for being with us all the week long and for everything that you've done in our lives. We give your name all the praise, honor, and glory for that, God. God, we do pray now that you would come in this moment. We pray that your word would come forth as your people should receive it. We pray, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable unto thee. For, Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do 
Do you ever wonder if God really hears your prayers? Do you ever question why God does not always respond to your prayers in the ways that you want God to respond to you when you pray? Do you ever think about what it is that you're asking God for when you pray? We all say that we believe in the power of prayer. Most of us can say without a shadow of a doubt that God has answered prayers that we have prayed. But if we are truthful, we can also say that when we are waiting for God to answer our prayers, sometimes we have some moments of doubt as to whether God is going to answer our prayer. And if we are mature Christians, we are sometimes wondering, how is God going to answer my prayer? In other words, will God give me exactly what I prayed for or will God answer me in a different way than I expected? And so today, God would have us to consider the subject based on our text. What are you praying for? What are you praying for? Our text today centers around the biblical account that is titled in most Bibles, Solomon's Prayer for Wisdom. Maybe the events in today's text are considered a prayer because Solomon is in conversation with God. You do know that one of the definitions of prayer is a prayer is a conversation with God. The interesting thing about a conversation is that it involves two parties. Few humans can have a conversation. Some would say that a human and a non-human can have a conversation like a pet, because we know some of us talk to our pets and some of us believe our pets talk back to us. And some of us even have conversations with ourselves. And I'm going to leave that right there. And then you can have a conversation with God where either God talks to you and you respond or you talk to God and God responds to you. The thing about our text for today is that this conversation between God and Solomon took place during a dream that Solomon was having. But nonetheless, this conversation during Solomon's dream is understood to be a prayer by Solomon, a conversation with God. So who was Solomon at this point in time when Solomon was praying to God? Solomon was one of David's sons, King David, that is. King David had just died and Solomon had just been named the new king. In addition to being the king after his father's death, Solomon had just married a daughter of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Solomon had just married an African woman, which he did in order to raise Israel's prominence in the international arena. The problem, however, is that Solomon was engaging in intermarrying which was forbidden according to the law of Moses, given to Moses by God. Keep that in mind because we're going somewhere with this. We also learn at the beginning of 1 Kings 3 that the time that Solomon married this Egyptian woman, he was in such a rush to begin to bring her to his new kingdom that he brought her to the city of David to Jerusalem even though he had not built a home for them to live in, even though he had not built a house for the Lord, and even though he had not built a wall around Jerusalem to protect the city from its enemies. Solomon was slacking on what God had tasked him to do. You do remember that God decided that David would not be the one to build him a house and that Solomon was to be the one to build him a house. But Solomon was slacking in what God had asked him to do. Keep this in mind as well. The third thing we learn, in addition to the fact that Solomon was intermarrying and Solomon was not fulfilling the task that God had given him, is that at the outset of 1 Kings 3, we learn that people in Jerusalem were going and sacrificing at the high places because the house of the Lord had not been built. And notwithstanding the fact that Solomon loved the Lord and walked according to his statutes the way his father did, Solomon too had been going and burning incense at the high places. This is a crucial point for us to consider 
before we move to Solomon's prayer. The high places were local cultic installations where people worship foreign gods. Deuteronomy 12, 13, and 14 explicitly contain the following as a part of the law of Moses. It said, do not offer your burnt offerings at any place you happen to see, but only go to the place that the Lord will choose. In other words, God had explicitly told Israel that he did not want them to engage in worship in a haphazard manner at any location, at any place that where other people were worshiping false gods. But they were only to worship God where God said he should be worshiped. Solomon was being disobedient. Our text makes clear that Solomon loved the Lord. Our text makes clear that Solomon walked in the statutes of his father, David. In other words, Solomon was trying to walk according to the example that his father had set for him about how to live in relationship with God. However, in verse 3, the wording makes clear that even though Solomon was doing these things, despite loving the Lord and despite trying to walk like his father, Solomon allowed himself to be influenced by the culture. And so he would go and worship God in a place and in a way that God did not want to be worshipped. So here we have Solomon, who is an example of what it means to live a conflicted life. On the one hand, he loved the Lord and was walking before God by the example his father had set for him. But by the same token, he had a foreign wife, which was disallowed. He had failed to build the temple as he had been instructed to do by God. And he was worshiping God in a way that was against the law of Moses. Why is any of this important? What does any of this have to do with prayer? It's important for us to understand that Solomon's faith life was a mixed bag, but God heard his prayer nonetheless. Like his father, Solomon was a man who loved God and did his best to walk in God's ways, but he was also disobedient in several respects and failed to live in a way that was always faithful to the law of Moses, to the word of God. In other words, Solomon is like a lot of us, like most of us. We are a mixed bag spiritually. Our text reminds us that notwithstanding the fact that our spiritual life and practices are all over the place, God can still hear and answer our prayers, even when we, the children of God, are not spiritually perfect. It could be said about most of us that we love God, and that we do our best to follow the commandments of God, but we also disobey God, and we desire things that God would not want for our lives. We act in ways that are not always consistent with being in relationship with God. No, we're not burning incense and offering sacrifices where people are worshiping false gods. But we all have our worship practices that are not pleasing to God. We pray to God and we play the lottery. We dance before the Lord and we dance in the club. We speak in unnamed tongues and we speak in cussing tongues. We sing songs of praise to God and we sing songs that only a potty mouth should be singing. We read the word and we read the work racy novels with the same eyes. Yes, spiritually like Solomon, we are a mixed bag. Yes, I know that there are some super saints among us who are blessed and highly favored all the time and there are some among us who always have the Holy Ghost and are fire baptized. And I know that there are those who spend all day in the seventh heaven with God, like John did. But for most of us, we are mere mortals. Most of us are spiritually a mixed bag. Most of us are spiritually disobedient sometimes. And sometimes it causes us to wonder whether God hears our prayers because of who we are. But what our text makes clear is that God will hear and respond to our prayers despite who we are, despite our spiritual disobedience, and despite the work in progress that we are. So today, someone needs to hear this. When the evil one begins to play tricks with your mind, and that the reason why God has not yet answered your prayers is because you are a spiritually mixed bag, remind yourself that if God required spiritual perfection to answer our prayers, 
none of our prayers would ever be answered. Solomon is our example of this. Before we can deal with the question of what are you praying for, God wants each of us to know that he hears our prayers, even if we are a spiritually mixed bag, even if we aren't spiritually perfect, and even if we've been disobedient. As we continue in our text, it emphasizes that Solomon went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For Gibeon was the principal high place. Solomon, the man who loved God, went to the main pagan place to offer sacrifices. When our text says later in verse 15 that the Ark of the Covenant was physically located in Jerusalem. But for some reason, Solomon went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices. To be fair to Solomon, Gibeon is the place where the tabernacle of the Lord, the tent of meeting once had been physically located. It was the place in the past where the people of God thought that they could find God. It would appear that maybe Solomon was on spiritual autopilot. Even though the Ark of the Covenant had been moved to Jerusalem, Solomon went back to the place where Israel used to find God. Now we know that God cannot be confined to one location, but from Israel's perspective, the location of the tent of meeting, the tabernacle of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, and later the temple, once it would be built, those would all be places in Israel's history where God's name could be evoked, that God's name could be invoked. It was not that God was restricted only to one place, but all of these places during Israel's history were where Israel understood that God's name and God's presence could be found. And so at the point when Solomon went to Gibeon, maybe he was going back to a familiar place where he'd invoked God's name in the past, but God had designated that his temple was to be built in Jerusalem and the Ark of the Covenant was now in Jerusalem. Solomon had been slow and slack to complete his assignment for God, which was to build God's temple. And because Solomon had been slow and slack in doing what God had told him to do, he found himself going back to Gibeon to find God, to worship God, and to offer burnt offerings to God. Is there anybody here whose worship life is on autopilot? Is there anybody who keeps going back to the same place where you once found God? But God has moved to a new dimension, a new location spiritually. Beloved, some of us are literally praying and dreaming about the day when we can walk back through the doors of the physical church so that we can see the sanctuary that we once knew, so that we can worship in the way that we once knew, so that we can invoke God's name in the way that we once knew. But what if God is moving to a new dimension? No, I'm not suggesting that God will no longer be found in the church when we once again come together and worship in physical presence. But what God is saying is that if we keep going back to Gibeon, looking for God, that maybe we won't find God because God has moved to Jerusalem. Then you're going to miss the new dimension in God. What are you praying for? Are you praying for the doors of the church to once open again? Are you praying that you would find God where God can be found? But here's the thing about God. Truth be told, God will meet us in Gibeon if that's where we are. God will meet us right where we are. That's what I love about God. Look at our scripture text. Even though Solomon went back to Gibeon, where the tabernacle of the Lord once had been and the tent of meeting once had been and the Ark of the Covenant once had been, even though Solomon sacrificed to God in the high places where the pagans were also sacrificing, God met Solomon right where Solomon was. God met Solomon in Gibeon. Somebody got to shout right there. Despite us being on autopilot looking for God, despite us wanting to worship God in the same ways, when God wants to do a new thing, despite us praying the same prayers by rote, in the morning when we wake up by rote, at noonday when we find ourselves in need by rote, in the evening when we go to bed by rote, at prayer meeting when we pray by 
God wrote. God will meet us right where we are, even when we are in Gibeon and not in Jerusalem. Look at verse 5. It says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God asked, ask what I should give you. This is the beginning of the conversation between God and Solomon. This is the beginning of Solomon's prayer to God, which began with God giving Solomon permission to ask for whatever Solomon desired. What would you pray for if God came to you and gave you permission to ask for whatever was the desire of your heart? Would you pray for wealth? Would you pray for health? Would you pray for a car? Or would you pray to be a star? Would you pray for a house? Or would you pray to get rid of that louse? What would you pray for? What are you praying for? Well, the best indicator of what you would pray for is what you are praying for these days. So what did Solomon pray for? Hold that question. Before Solomon prayed to God in verse 6, Solomon praised God. Solomon said, you have shown great steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great steadfast love and given him a son on the throne today. In other words, Solomon praised God for showing steadfast love to Solomon's father, David, and for keeping God's promise to put one of David's sons on the throne. Before you pray and ask God for the desires of your heart, how many of us go to God and thank him for his steadfast love and his promises. The notion of God's steadfast love is a very Jewish notion. It is the, some would say the same argument and same theme as God's grace. In the Old Testament, God's steadfast love and unfailing love is what we would call in the New Testament, God's grace. And so we find that Solomon is thanking God for his steadfast love what we would call his grace. He was also thanking him for uh, being a promise keeper, for, for putting him on the throne and for continuing the line of David that God had promised he would do. Before you even begin to whisper a prayer to God, do you praise God for his steadfast love? Do you praise God for the, the work that God is doing in your life? Do you praise God for the grace at work in your life? Do you praise God for being a promise keeper? Do you praise God for anything before you begin to petition God? When you're praying to God, do you have the right posture as you approach God? Do you come to God giving God praise for God's grace and for being a promise keeper in your life? Before Solomon petitioned God for anything, not only did he praise God for God's steadfast love, and not only did he praise God for being a promise keeper, but Solomon also came to God in great humility. Verse 7 says, I am an only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Solomon wasn't a child. Solomon was an adult. But what Solomon was saying to God is, I'm coming to you with great humility, as if I am a child. When we pray, some of us approach God with a sense of entitlement. But Solomon exemplified real humility in the way that he approached God. When you're praying to God, how do you approach God? Do you approach God as humble as you know how? Verse 9, which actually contains Solomon's prayer, is also exhibit A as to the humble way that Solomon prayed to God. When asked by God, what should I give you? This is what Solomon asked for. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. The New Living Translation put Solomon's prayer request this way. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. And the Message Bible records Solomon's prayer like this. Give me a good listening heart so I can lead your people well, discerning the difference between good and evil. Solomon did not pray for wealth or good health. 
Solomon didn't pray for a car or to be a star. Solomon didn't pray for a house or that God would get rid of that louse. No, Solomon's prayer request was for wisdom to lead the people of God and to know the difference between good and evil. What are you praying for? Do you pray for wisdom? Do you pray for the ability to know the difference between good and evil, between right and wrong? According to verse 10, Solomon's prayer request, it pleased the Lord so much. And because God was pleased about what Solomon prayed for, God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I will give you what you ask for, as well as I will give you some bonus blessings. The Message Bible puts it this way. Because you've asked for this and haven't grasped after a long life or riches or the doom of your enemies, I'll give you what you ask for. I'm giving you a wise and mature heart. As a bonus, I'm giving you also both wealth and glory you didn't even ask for. Did you hear what God said? God gave Solomon some bonus blessings because Solomon didn't pray for resilience, which is long life, because Solomon didn't pray for riches, which is wealth, because Solomon didn't pray for retribution or revenge, which involves taking the life of an enemy. Because Solomon did not pray for resilience and riches and retribution or revenge, God said, I will give you not only wisdom, but I will also give you riches. I will give you a reputation. I will give you respect if you will be obedient in your ways. What are you praying for? As I reflected on the fact that God granted Solomon's prayer request and gave Solomon some bonus blessings, God directed me to Matthew 6, 33, where Jesus said, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be given unto you as well. Jesus was reminding his disciples, as he's reminding us today, that we need to strive for the things of God, wisdom and understanding and obedience and discernment. And when we do all of this, when we pray for God to all of this be given to us, he will also add other things unto us. Seeking the things of God first. And any wealth that you need will be a bonus blessing. Seek the things of God first. And any health blessing you need will be a bonus blessing. Think the things of God first. And any food and shelter and clothing that you need will be a bonus blessing. Seek the things of God first. And any employment that you need will come in the form of a bonus blessing. Seek the things of God first, and any relationship that we need will come in the form of a bonus blessing. Seek the things of God first, and any protection or any vindication that we need will come in the form of a bonus blessing. God said to Solomon in verse 14, If you will walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Church, we've got to learn to Put God first, especially in our prayer life, especially as it comes to the petitions before God. What are you praying for? Are you praying for a closer walk with God? What are you praying for? Are you praying to live a more obedient life before God? What are you praying for? Are you praying for the ability to know good from evil? What are you praying for? Are you praying for the ability to know right from wrong? What are you praying for? Are you praying that you can always discern and hear the word will of God in your life in every situation? What are you praying for? Are you praying for more faith in your life? What are you praying for? Are you praying for more boldness in your life? What are you praying for? Are you praying for more belief in your life? What are you praying for? Are you praying for more power in your life? Today, God knows the answer of what you've been praying for, but he's come to ask you the question, to make you look in the old mirror and ask yourself, what are you praying for? In Jesus' name, amen. God, thank you for reminding us that 
You hear our prayers, even though we're not perfect. Thank you, God, for reminding us that you can find us right where we are. Thank you for reminding us that there's a way that we should come to you in prayer with humility of heart. And thank you for reminding us that when we talk with you, God, that our prayers are to be prayers for the things of God, that we might be a part of the kingdom of God. And so, God, if there's somebody under the sound of my voice today that needs to start that conversation with you, the relationship with you, if you need to accept Christ Jesus this day, won't you just pray the prayer of salvation, saying that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he was raised on the third day, and that he's coming back again. If you believe that in your heart, then you will be saved. If you're here and you needed to be reminded that maybe your prayer life isn't what it should be, and you need a little tune-up in that department, God is speaking to you and asking you, what are you praying for? And if you're here and you need to unite with the church and you want to be a part of Lomax, you can text us, you can email us, you can call us and we'll call back to you. What are you praying for? What are you praying for? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. And we pray that you would have a wonderful and blessed week and that heaven would continue to smile upon you. God bless. How many times have you prayed in your life? Now, I'm not asking how many lists you've made or how many religious instructions you've obeyed or how many games of guilty Christian you've played or how many public speeches you've relayed or how many recitations you've portrayed. I'm asking, how many times have you prayed? How many times have you cried, whimpered, sighed, whispered, tried to listen, died and risen? How many times have you approached God honestly, asking for nothing but got everything, had everything to hide but hid nothing, said not a word but spoke endlessly, never opened your eyes but saw eternity? How many times have you reached inside yourself so deeply that you pulled out something you didn't recognize? How many times have you approached your maker, not as who you want to be, not as who you wish you were, not as who you think you are, not as who you ought to be, but just as you are, with all the dirt that covered you when God first fell in love with you? How many times have you run to your lover for passion, your provider for rations, your father for lessons, your instructor for lashings? Oh, how many times? Have you prayed? For your God's ear it waits for one drop of confession, one honest expression, one wild connection. Don't approach the living God with dead prayers, but come to him when your lifeless prayers are dead and the spirit on your tongue is dripping with life. Then every syllable you speak will be a divine trade. Your mouth will leak with the flood of praise that you've made. Then the number you seek will be far too high to be weighed and you'll never be able to answer the question, how many times have you prayed?